Whether you read poetry or not, you have undoubtedly been touched by poetry's power or the people who write poetry. There is so much that we can learn from poets, like how to connect to our own feelings, why it's important to truly slow down, and how to use our emotions, even the uncomfortable ones, as a force for good. The process of noticing the world and writing it through a poetic lens has a super unique power to serve as a bridge to deeply process deep experiences like grief or memory, injustice, identity, or the communities around us. And a deeper understanding of those themes allows us to care for ourselves, others, and the world better. And today's guest is an expert on this. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Harvey. Our guest this week is Maggie Smith, and I am so excited about it. In 2016, Maggie's poem, Good Bones, went absolutely viral. It's this poem that speaks to resilience in a dark world. And I think it kind of blew up because it was both timely and timeless. It reached the internet in a year where all of our attention was focused on injustices in the world. We were thinking about people seeking refuge from war and conflict, the heartbreaking number of mass shootings in the United States, and of course, the political division that we were all experiencing on a super profound level. And Maggie's words spoke to that, and it it spoke to something very true that we were experiencing, and it was incredibly honest about the internal emotions that many of us were feeling. And I actually included a link in our show notes to the short poem in case you wanted a reminder of how great it is, or if you wanted to read it for the first time, if you didn't read it the first time that it was making its way around. But this moment, the publication of Good Bones, is when most of us became acquainted with Maggie Smith in her beautiful and meaningful poetry. And in addition to writing Good Bones, Maggie is a Pushcart Prize-winning poet. Her work has been published in the New York Times, the Paris Review, and a bunch of other amazing places. And her new collection of poetry is called Goldenrod, and it explores themes like identity, parenthood, loss, memory. I loved it. Maggie describes herself as a recovering pessimist, and so you know that we had to have a conversation about that. We talked about how and why she's fighting for optimism, how poetry helps her better understand the world's pain and beauty, and the challenges of raising children in a time of injustice. I am not necessarily the number one poetry reader, so if you aren't either, that's okay. But I loved getting to learn from Maggie. She is just so delightful to listen to, and I have no doubt that you will love learning from her too. So without any further ado, let's dive straight into our conversation. I want to start off by saying, you know, I, I know that probably as an author, it's it's always a little bit weird doing like the pre-press stuff because nobody has read your book yet except for the interviewers. So I just want to affirm that uh, I love your new book. I sat on my porch and I read it from my porch as like the sun and the breeze hit me. And it just felt so good. I love your words. And and so that's why I'm excited to talk. Oh, thank you. And you did it right. Like sitting on the porch, watching the sun go down, reading poems. That's the yes. way to do it. Well, in Portland, we only get like three months of perfect weather. And so uh-huh. I am trying to make the most of it before rain season comes back. <laughs> yeah. Look, Ohio is the same way. So I'm, I'm with you. So your new book is called Goldenrod. When did you begin writing the poems for this collection? Because you had a book come out in 2020, which means, you know, I know that there's time before between writing and publishing. So like, is this a pandemic book? Is this pre-pandemic, post-pandemic? Yeah. I mean, writing a book of poems is sort of unlike writing any other kind of mm. book because you don't really, I think if you're doing it right, you don't really start writing a book of poems. You write a poem at a time and they accrue over usually years. And I'm, I'm fairly slow. I think 
you know, it's, it's difficult to work and parent and, and make space for all of this. So, uh, really what I did was I finished my last book of poems, Good Bones, um, in about 2015. And that book came out in 2017. So really Goldenrod is all of the poems since Good Bones. Wow. Okay. Minus a bunch of them. So I print everything out, you know, and it was uh, over a hundred poems, I think. And then I wrote a bunch of new ones. Um, some of them, yes, during the pandemic. So there are some pandemic poems in this book. And then I kind of go through and I pull out the ones I'm not excited about. And I look for poems that are in conversation with each other and sort of winnow it down to um, I don't know, 35, 40, 45, 50 poems that I think feel like they want to travel together in a book. So, so my last book, Keep Moving, I wrote um, in sort of a year's time, but I was continuing to write poems for this book while I was working on those essays. Fascinating. Okay. The, I have always wondered about that process. And so as you're curating these poems, of course, the through line is that they are things you have written and they are things that, you know, have spoken to your experiences. But then when you're curating in the end and you're you're figuring out which poems will travel together, I imagine a theme starts to come to life. And how would you describe the theme of Goldenrod? Yeah, I mean, several themes usually come to light. And that's part of the fun of the process is, is printing everything out and seeing what you've been doing or learning what you've been doing all along that you didn't know you were doing. So, you know, I might print all the poems out and be like, wow, there are a lot of birds in these poems, or there are a lot of plants, or there are a lot of um, looking at the origins of words or how words are related or maps or um, different themes and motifs. And and that's the, the fun point of discovery for me is seeing the thing take shape when really I've kind of been too close to it to know all along. And so for this book, I mean, in some ways, each book is is a continuation of your previous body of work, but it's also a departure. You know, it's like something new, but not so, so new. So a lot of the themes from, from Good Bones and even from Keep Moving come up in Goldenrod. I mean, there's a lot about mothering and memory and identity and how we know what we know. And a lot about perspective, like how we see things and how we might change the way that we see things. Looking at the the books I've written, I kind of consider it like a continued conversation with readers that started with the first poems I was publishing. And it's just like growing up, you know, like you've had friends who've known you for 20 years and yes, you've changed. You're not exactly the same as you were 20 years ago, but you're still you. And and I think our work is is like that too. I love that. I think that's a beautiful description. And as you were saying that, one of your poems from Goldenrod came to mind, which is your poem, Airplanes. And I, I wonder if you could read that poem for us. This is Airplanes, inspired by peeking in on my son um, while he was sleeping. Airplanes. My son is safe in bed, the opposite of gut shot. He is three years old and wearing new airplane pajamas with feet and a zipper running ankle to throat. My son is sprawled on his back, arms flung, don't shoot wide. This year, I was a nun of the pictures, and yet I am in all of them. That's me, there, the shadow that shielded his eyes each time the year shot another mother's son in the street. No, not the year. Never the year. His body is white. It's only his eyes I have to shield. In the dark, I watch his chest rise and fall, his lids flicker. My son is sleeping covered in airplanes and the airplanes are smiling. This poem stands out to me because I, I think it speaks to that intersection of many things that you were speaking of earlier, motherhood and your children and the experience of, you know, what's been happening in the United States over the last year. 
and I mean, much longer than the last year, uh, but it speaks to it so profoundly. And I mean, you also spoke to this idea of, of being in relationship with your readers for years and years and ever since the, the earlier poems that you have published. And I guess something that I, I was processing through is one of your most iconic poems is your 2016 poem, Good Bones. And you essentially wrestle with what to tell your children about the difficult and heartbreaking world that they're growing up in. And you described the world as, and this is almost a little bit funny for our community of hopeful people, uh -huh. uh, you described <laughs> the world as at least 50% terrible, <laughs> which is yeah. a, a glass half empty, a little bit less than half empty mentality. <laughs> and it was such a beautiful poem. And I think it spoke to the weight that so many of us were feeling in 2016. And how has your outlook changed, if at all, over the last five years? And how has it stayed the same as evidenced by you know, this poem wrestling with that same dichotomy? Well, here's an interesting thing about this poem. This poem was written um, around the same time as Good Bones. So in, in the poem, my son is three. Well, my son is almost nine now. So um, this this is me still in that sort of time period grappling um, with what I tell them and what I don't. And so much of Good Bones was about, um, you know, shielding my kids from the worst of the world, but not wanting to lie to them. And I guess one thing that has changed over the past, you know, five years since that poem was published, uh, six years since it was written, is that I'm having those difficult conversations with my kids now because they're older. I mean, I can't keep my seventh grader from knowing about what happens in the world. Like that's just, it's not realistic and also not healthy. <laughs> you know, when she was four, it was pretty easy to click off NPR in the car or not have her watch the news or read the newspaper or know about things. Um, you know, my kids are in a generation that have done lockdown drills in their elementary schools without knowing what it was for. You know, like a bad guy might be in the school. They were doing lockdown drills and not knowing about the school shootings that made those part of the protocol. And so they've grown up pretty sheltered, but I think this poem acknowledges that one of the reasons I've been able to shelter my kids is because they are white and mm. middle class. And, you know, a lot of parents didn't get to shield their kids the way I talk about in Good Bones, because in order for their kids to be safe leaving their homes, they had to know about the dangers in the world. And so even even that ability to shield our children is a, is a marker of privilege. And I think I'm, I'm confronting that more and more um, as I get older and wiser and as my children get older and wiser. I think that's a really, really good way of, of describing this because I think this is something we think about a lot at Good, Good, Good is if you have the privilege of news happening you know, of hearing about the news through NPR instead of news happening to you, then you have the responsibility to use that privilege for good to some degree. And because of that, you know, at least for me as a white middle class man living in, you know, Portland, Oregon, uh, I think it means that I have the responsibility to the best of my ability to be paying attention to the heartbreak and the pain and the injustice in the world and not, you know, turn it off, shut myself out. And of course I'm an adult, not a child, but uh, that's a, that's a tension that I'm wrestling with. And I think so many people in our community are as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, a lot of this book is about paying attention and in, in the sort of quieter moments, it's about paying attention to, sort of beauty in the present moment and not taking things for granted. But I think it's also about um, paying attention as, as part of our responsibility as human beings, <laughs> you know, like not closing our eyes when it would be convenient to close our eyes. Like 
like really facing things, even when facing it might implicate us um, or, or put the ball in our court when we might want to pass it to someone else. And when it requires difficult conversations or, or maybe opening our, our children's eyes to things that we wish we didn't have to, but it's, it's part of, it's part of our responsibility to do so. So it's funny, like the last book was called Keep Moving. And I, I've been thinking lately that, that maybe a sort of secret invisible ink subtitle for goldenrod is be still because it's about noticing like we, you know, writing that last book and going through my divorce, I was really sort of pressing forward as a way of coping. Like I just had to, to move into the next day and frankly, the next hour, the next five minutes, I just had to sort of plug along. And so part of what I want to do now, particularly after this last year and a half or so is just sort of kind of take stock and, and pay closer attention attention to things that maybe, um, I sort of sped by in an attempt, um, to get to a better place, you know, last year or so. I don't think that I had pinpointed that, but I think that maybe that's why I, I was so especially drawn to Goldenrod because I am bad at staying still. I am the moving <laughs> character. And so I'm always drawn to somebody who can, who can speak to the benefits of being still and noticing things. And that, that seems to me as something that poetry is very good at. You know, you're zooming very closely into something and you're talking about details that, you know, I may not be seeing and definitely wouldn't be describing in the beautiful way that you describe things. And so I guess, how do you handle that tension of, I think I think it sounds like it was important for you to keep on moving through your divorce and through the challenging experiences that we've all had over the last several years. And at the same time, it sounds like you also fully believe that it's important to sit still. And is it something that should be done in seasons? Is it something that should be done both at the same time? Is one better than the other? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I don't know if it's really a, a hierarchy, but I do think, you know, we we live in a in a time where we often um, associate our worth with how busy we are and how productive we are. And there's sort of this cult of productivity that really goes against the idea of slowing down and paying attention. And it's sort of uh, not the space that poetry occupies. So, you know, I think there are times when we need to sort of maybe put our heads down and, and push forward because that's, that's what's going to be most useful to us. And then there are times where we need to stop and take a breath. And it might be that you have to do both in the same day <laughs> or in the same hour. And it may be that, that there are seasons, um, seasons for this. I mean, I, I think, you know, Robert Rauschenberg, the artist Robert Rauschenberg said that the job of an artist is to, is to keep people's eyes open. And I think that's kind of the job of poets, and your eyes can be open as you're moving quickly <laughs> through the world, but you'll notice a lot more if you slow down every once in a while and just sort of, um, you know, put your phone away, maybe take your headphones off and listen and, um, you know, schedule a little, a little nothing time into your day. I think it's incredibly important. You can be so busy and what does it add up to? I just, I don't find that satisfying. I, I need a lot of kind of like the white space between stanzas and po you know and poetry i need i need white space in my days and weeks to kind of be myself and process things i absolutely hate everything you just said and love what you just said because i think you just <laughs> you just diagnosed me so thank you <laughs> you feel called out <laughs> uh, yeah i'm stopping this interview right now <laughs> <laughs> and scene <laughs> We are going to take a quick break. And when we're back, Maggie is sharing about the importance of being present with the world, even in moments of grief and discomfort. You don't want to miss this. We will be right back. Mm -hmm. 
Sounds Good is sponsored by Libro FM. Now, Libro FM is the only audiobook company that lets you support a local bookstore every time you download an audiobook. If you are already an audiobook fan and you are using the other company, the competitor, I'm going to tell you this is a great day to switch over because Libro FM is the exact same thing, but it supports a local company. Basically, here's how it works. Libro FM members get one audiobook credit per month for $14.99. Does that price sound familiar? It's the same price as the big guy. Uh, and you can use it on any audiobook you want. They have a full selection of every audiobook out there, uh, which sounds a lot like the big guy. And when you download audiobooks through Libro FM, you help support a local bookstore of your choosing, which does not sound like the big guy. In fact, it sounds like you're supporting the biggest guy in the world. Uh, you get to keep your money within your local economy, create local jobs, and make a difference in your community. And I just saw right before recording this ad randomly that our beloved podcast guest, Maggie Smith, her brand new collection of poems, Goldenrod, is on Libro FM. I read the actual book. I mean, it was it was delightful. You heard her read the poem on the show. It was beautiful. I loved hearing it from her voice. Maybe I will also get the audiobook. You can get any audiobook you want because as a special offer for Sounds Good listeners, Libro FM is offering two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with the code GOOD. So if you are using that other company, just go hit the cancel button. Even hit the pause button if you're nervous about it. There is one. They'll let you do that. And then go over to Libro FM, get your free audiobook. Join is the same price. You've got access to all the same audiobooks. And then during the sign up process, choose your favorite local bookstore. Choose a local business in your community and choose to support them just by downloading audiobooks every month. It is delightful. All you have to do is visit the website libro.fm. That's L I B R O.fm and use the promo code GOOD to get started with two audiobooks and to help support your community and to help support this show. Sounds Good is brought to you by Bev. Bev is a woman-owned and run canned wine brand on a mission to give a voice to women in an industry that has ignored them at best and objectified them at worst. This one is for the ladies and the good dudes who are doing it right. Bev has four varietals of wine. They've got Rosé, Sauv Blanc, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir. They also have their sparkling wine, which is available exclusively to Bev Club members, which you should totally become. And all of their wines are crisp, dry, a little bit fizzy, super refreshing and delicious. They are all zero sugar with just three carbs and 100 calories per serving. And here's the thing. The cans, if you look on the website, they may look cute and tiny, but each can is a glass and a half of wine which is perfect for when you don't want to open a bottle of wine just for yourself. One 24-pack is equal to eight bottles of wine. So every order, you are getting your money's worth. And here's the amazing thing. You can get two-day shipping straight to your door, and the shipping is always covered by Bev. Always, always, always. And we worked out a special deal for Sounds Good Podcast listeners. In addition to the delightful free shipping, get 20% off your first purchase with the code Good. 20. All you have to do is go to drinkbev.com, enter the code GOOD20 at checkout to claim this deal. One more time, that's D-R-I-N-K-B-E-V.com and use the code GOOD20. I, I guess kind of similarly, another theme that I saw a lot of in this book is is grief. I, the grief of divorce, of perhaps children growing older, of death. And I'm also seeing grief around the broken parts of this country. And I think often we think of death and I guess like divorce and significant life changes when we think about the things to grieve, but maybe less so the heartbreak pain and injustice in the world. And what's your process of, of grieving the pain outside of your own life been like? What's been the process of grieving the pain of the country and the world? A lot of how I process grief, whether it's sort of my personal experience or sort of collective grief, is by writing. 
Mm. It's how I discover what I think. I often don't know what I think or feel about a thing until I put pen to paper. Um, and so a lot of my processing happens happens in poems and, and in essays and in conversations. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, even, even with the pandemic, even when we had to talk with friends via Zoom, um, you know, on a Wednesday night, now we can get together again. But, you know, we're having these tough conversations. Like we are having these, like, who are we? What have we done? Where do we go now? You know, yes, personally, but also, um, you know, as a country, like what, what, what direction are we moving in? And how do we, how do we turn? Like how many of us need to lean in one direction to steer this thing in a different way? Um, and I think, you know, both writing and, and having these difficult conversations are really important because the, the other alternative, right, is just like this closed circuit feedback loop of scrolling your phone or watching the news, feeling stressed, and then just scrolling your phone more and watching the news and feeling stressed. I mean, it, it needs to leave the body in some way, um, whether it's through speech or through writing or in therapy or through meditation or yoga or long distance running or, you know, whatever the thing is, I don't, I, I think we have to metabolize it and not just let it sit inside ourselves. And, and poetry is like one of my best metabolizing <laughs> activities. When you are writing poetry as a means to process, how much of it is you writing just for yourself and how much of it is also thinking through, this might help somebody else process this if they read this one day? Um, it's pretty much all the former and not really any of the latter when it comes to poems. Um, I think if I thought too much about audience, like who I would hand the poem to when I thought it was done, I probably would never finish it and hand it to anyone because it would never be the thing, capital T. You know, um, you know, if I had known how many people would read Good Bones, I never would have finished it because I would have just choked. <laughs> so I think, you know, for me, writing a poem is different from, say, writing, a, you know, a piece of copy or something even commissioned work where I have a sense of audience and purpose for that piece of writing from the from the get go, because the person is asked for X and I am to deliver X. Well, no one is asking for poems by and large. You know, there it's a supply and demand issue where I am supplying something for which um, depending on the person, there is sometimes not that much demand. And I'm doing it anyway, um, in part because I, I revel in that sort of anti-capitalist <laughs> <laughs> mindset of poetry. It's one of the best things about it. But but also because it's it's a conversation I'm having with myself on paper. Like that is the purest thing I can do. And so when I'm drafting, I'm not thinking about where the poem's going to go. I'm not thinking about who might read it. I'm not thinking about what it's supposed to do because the quickest way to kill a poem is to try to get it to do something or say something or be something. Um, I'm just kind of putting my antenna up and trying to listen and follow the language and, and discover where it's leading me without getting my ego in the way and trying to drive the bus. And then in editing the poem, like when I've got a few drafts under my belt and I feel like I'm sort of refining it, then I start thinking about like, okay, are there pieces of this that won't be clear to a reader who doesn't live in my brain? Like, is there a transition that's needed? Is there, um, is there some essential information I've left out? Or in turn, is there stuff in here that's just kind of extraneous that I could that I could remove. And so then I start to think about it more as a piece of work that will live in the world. But at first, I really don't because I want to protect the creative impulse and not censor myself. I think that's so good. And that's so difficult to do, uh, especially if you know you are somebody who has published several books of poetry and to, to write something and to not expect it to make it into the world somehow is is a challenging feat. And I think that's probably true for, I think, a lot of people who, even if they're not a poet, you know, maybe they're writing an Instagram caption and thinking, 
maybe the words are starting off as just, I need to process through this. And then at one point you go, well, this would go good with a picture. You put it online. <laughs> but having that separation of what the intention of this thing is, I think is so important. And again, helps us just pay attention and, and notice and slow down. Yeah, I agree. And it's also the difference between art and commerce, right? I mean, if I'm crafting an Instagram ca caption, I'm doing that to share something publicly in the moment. Um, that to me feels like a really different process from writing a poem, because frankly, not all the poems I write do have an audience. I don't send everything out. Not all the, you know, 130 poems that I've written since Good Bones was published made it into Goldenrod. You know, some of those poems will never get called up to the major leagues. They will continue to, you know, play on the farm team or sit on the bench. <laughs> um, they 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 don't get to to do it. And and so it's I don't know. It's it's challenging, but I think it's important as much as we can to kind of protect the inner life where the poems are made and not to um, get ahead of ourselves and start thinking about things like publication um, when we're just trying to, to figure the thing out. What would you say is the equivalent for non-poets or for people who don't think of themselves as poets yet? Like how, how can I, as somebody who's not a poet, like bring that into my own life and experience? I mean, if we're thinking about sort of pure expression and not self-censoring, a lot of it's just about sort of trusting your gut and being yourself. And that that you do in every choice you make, right? It's like when you get up in the morning and you decide what you're going to wear. And you're like, oh, God, I feel like people kind of eye rolled when I showed up in overalls to something recently, but I really want to wear overalls. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do it. One of the things I, I learned especially post-divorce is like the pleasure of doing things for oneself. Like I don't actually have to watch this show that I didn't really enjoy. I get to pick what I want to watch. And I don't actually, you know, I don't actually love that color, even though the person loved it on me. So I'm going to wear this. And I know they like this perfume, but I actually prefer this one, even though they didn't really like it. So I think there are ways that we can express ourselves in daily life, whether we even consider our, ourselves creative or not, that that sort of allow us to do things for ourselves without worrying so much what other people think, which I realize in the age of social media and sort of constant access to people is, is maybe a, a tall order, you know? Yeah, it's very um, punk rock. <laughs> to push back on that. I like that. I feel like poetry is very, it's very punk rock. It's very just anti-establishment. I think about, we, we've had a few poets on the show and, and that's why I'm still like so unfamiliar. I'm still learning. But everybody we've had on the show, uh, the first two people that come to mind are Anise Moshgani and Clint Smith, if you know them. Yes, I do. And I just am so drawn to them. I think that they're, you know, I and you too. I just think that there is a, a an energy that poets carry that that genuinely helps me feel more comfortable with myself. And surprisingly, even though you know, you wrote a, a fairly cynical, iconic, beautiful poem. Somehow you leave me feeling more hopeful because I think that if somebody who, you know, if I'm projecting onto you, I, I see you as somebody who's really comfortable diving into s the pain of the world and of your life and really paying close attention and not numbing that and still continuing anyway and still creating things and, and and working to create something beautiful anyway. And to me, that's very, very hopeful. Oh, well, that's so moving to me. That's what, maybe one of my best compliments. So thank you. I mean, I, I consider myself kind of a recovering pessimist in that I, you know, I, I think I grew up really with a sort of glass half empty attitude about a lot of things, just not expecting things to turn out the way that I had hoped and I realized, you know, a couple of years ago that I was just stealing so much joy from my own life by expecting the worst, because oftentimes the worst doesn't happen. 
But in that time that you've been worrying, you've just poisoned all of that time with worry. And for what? You know, I'm, I mean, I'm certainly not like a, a Pollyanna optimist. I don't think everything is is all right and and we shouldn't worry. I mean, there's a lot of things that we need to be worrying about. I think I'm more of a realist now. But but I do feel hopeful. Um, and I think I feel hopeful even when things are hard because I have the perspective to know that they weren't always that hard and therefore they won't stay that hard. You know, life life is short, as I wrote in Good Bones, but in some ways it's also long. And so if I can kind of pull back and look at a difficult time and see that really it's just like a blip on the the big long timeline of the life I'm living, that helps me keep perspective. And then I can look around that little blip and see all the beautiful things that are happening too. And maybe I'm not commemorating those in the same way because we do tend, I think, to fixate on what's not going well rather than getting up in the morning and thinking about the 50 things in our lives that are going amazing. It's just really easy to focus on the two that are making the most noise. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. I think that that just spoke to me in a deep way. And not to like try to throw myself into the same bunch as, you know, my my favorite poets, but I feel like one thing that our community, we know it good, 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 that like we are never going to have this mass appeal because it I don't think it's possible to hold. I think that there's something really, really challenging about holding on to that tension of hope and cynicism, of optimism and pessimism. And there's a certain small group of people who are willing to kind of engage with that battle. And that's who we want to hang out with. Like, <laughs> that's who we want to spend our time with. And I think that working hard to, find the good every day when it is truly so much easier, probably on a neurological level to fixate on those two bad things that happened. Like that, that is a very challenging thing. And so I think anytime that we can push back on that culture, I I do think that it it brings us something that, you know, it's either better or it's just, it's different and different is a, is a helpful perspective. It is always. My final question, I'm thinking about this idea of paying attention to the heartbreak and the pain and the injustice in the world and not turning away from it. And as a part of that, just paying a little bit closer attention to more things and being comfortable just sitting in that. And I wonder what advice you would give me and our listeners about how we can do that from you know, a poet's perspective? You know, most of my poems begin with just a scrap of language scrawled into a notebook or on a legal pad or maybe spoken into the, you know, the little audio function on my iPhone. And most of them begin either sitting at a window or sitting on my porch or taking a walk or going on a long drive and having my phone put away, like not using that as an opportunity to scroll or check Twitter or catch up on email. So I guess maybe one of my pieces of advice would be um, to sort of find pockets of your day when you're not multitasking, you know, um, monotask, (laughs) single task, Um, because it's so easy. And I see even my kids doing it, like the impulse to do multiple things at the same time as a way of getting things, you know, quote unquote done. And, you know, there, there's a value to that and there's a time for that, but also just giving yourself some space to listen and watch and sort of engage your senses. It doesn't even have to be time you spend alone. You can do that with a friend. You can take Mm. a long walk in the woods with a friend. You can, you can have a conversation that's really enriching where you're really focused on the other person and that's not multitasking. So I think that's, that's what I would say is like, how do we, 
how do we strip some of this everything all the time (laughs) culture out of ourselves, at least for parts of the day when we can? That is Maggie Smith, Pushcart Prize-winning poet and the author of the new poetry collection, Goldenrod. You should absolutely pick up a copy of Goldenrod wherever you buy your books. It is beautiful. It is so good. Of course, the link is in our show notes. And make sure that you follow Maggie on Instagram and Twitter. She's at Maggie Smith Poet on both. And check out her other collections of poetry on her website, maggiesmithpoet.com. This podcast was created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. We have an all new website and I cannot wait for you to see it. It is filled to the brim with good news and ways to take good action. So check it out at goodgoodgood.co. This episode was created by Sarah Lee, Megan Burns, and me, Brandon Harvey. It was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. And you can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Make sure to hit the follow button wherever you listen to podcasts so that you can get a new episode of Sounds Good delivered straight to your phone each Monday while you sleep. And if you have a favorite episode of the show, go to our new website, search for it in the little search bar thing and share the link to it with a friend. It'll help more people find good news on our website and good news on our podcast. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and slow down to better understand the world. And we'll be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good?